From New York, the truth, the headlines, right now. It's been almost a year since the awful tragedy at Sandy Hook, the shooting, as we remember the 27 innocent lives that were lost that day. 20 of the victims were children, and new details are unfolding. Seven 911 calls were placed from Sandy Hook Elementary School, and some of them were just made public today. Very sensitive, dramatic, scary stuff. Let's, let's take a listen. Pick down 911. What's the location of the emergency? Sandy Hook School. I think there's somebody shooting in here. Sandy Hook School. Okay, what makes you think that? Because somebody's got a gun. I saw a glimpse of somebody. They're running down the hallway. Okay. Well, they're still running. They're still shooting. Right. Sandy Hook School, please. I, I don't think there's any other way to look at this other than a absolute horrific tragedy that took place on December 14th of last year. We're also learning more about the shooter and his history with mental illness, Adam Lanza. The state's attorney general out of Danbury, Connecticut, released dozens of documents related to the investigation on Monday. The collection actually includes a book Lanza created back in the fifth grade titled The Big Book of Granny. And in this bizarre fictional story, Lanza describes very violent scenes that Granny carries out against children and even adults. Then there's a new book entitled Newtown, An American Tragedy, which comes out next week and it gives us information about the mother, Nancy Lanza. The book reports that back in 2000, Nancy had noticed something very wrong about her son. And with this glimpse into the 20-year-old shooter's history of mental illness and obsession with murder, it seems pretty obvious here. But the left in this country seems to want to look past all of this and instead allow special interest groups to use the anniversary to politicize and promote their beliefs on gun control. Here to discuss this with me is Neil McCabe. He's the Guns and Patriots newsletter editor. And Carolyn reinach wolf she's the director of mental health law at Abrams Fensterman, New York. Um, Neil, I'm going to start with you. Um, sure. I'm looking, I'm looking at some of these uh, executive actions that were supposedly taken after uh, a Newtown. And I, 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 some part of me sees really nothing here that the government doesn't already do, like appointing a director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. But now that we're learning more about Adam and even Nancy Lanza, um, I just don't understand what gun control law would have prevented this if this new book by a Daily News reporter claims that she lied to acquire the guns knowing that her son might have access to them. Oh, sure. I, I think that uh, one thing that people miss is that had somebody had a gun, either an armed guard or, or somebody who just happened to have a gun, maybe a landscaper or somebody at the building, this whole incident would have been over in, in five seconds. You know, when I heard those, those calls that you just played, I mean, it's absolutely, it's almost pornographic, uh, just, just the tragedy and, uh, you know, that they, I'm almost shocked that they would even release it on the anniversary. It seems almost a, a, a weird fetish, but you know the, the tragedy is that the police could arrive in five or ten or fifteen, twenty minutes, and, and the and the whole and all the shooting is over. If somebody had a gun there, you know we wouldn't have had this problem at all. You know you talk about mental illness. You know for many many years uh, it was a lot easier to determine whether somebody should be out on their own or not, and the state had remedies to uh, you know, various degrees of locking them up or securing them. But we were told that this was unfair and this was unconstitutional, and, and there was no role for society to control these people, and, and now here we are. Uh, the answer is not to eliminate guns. Certainly, that was a gun-free zone, and sadly, uh, I believe it because it was a gun-free zone that those people were killed. Uh, Carolyn, this new book um, by Matthew uh, Lysiak, I think I'm saying his name right, says that, that uh, Nancy Lanza saw her son as kind of a, a lost cause but took him shooting anyway 
and left him with access to her firearms. I don't think any law on the books would have prevented this tragedy if, if this turns out to be true. No, I agree. I think it's the gun control conversation needs to be had. But I think the real issue we have to start to talk about is mental health services. What are the mental health issues here? How do we get out in front of all of this? Um, we work with families all the time who come to us and say we're seeing this going on with our son or daughter or teachers who call and say we're concerned about certain behaviors. You know, that's the conversation that needs to go on and then a process by which we can intervene early on, be proactive, get people into the treatment they need. Um, and you can train lay people to know what those, what I call red flags are, to identify behaviors that are of concern. And like writing a book where the main character, when a fifth grader writes a main book, a character about a mass murderer, that, that might be it? That's a, bl a glaring red flag. Changes in behavior, saying things about wanting to kill people or hurt yourself. Those are all red flags that you can train teachers, you can train college campus staff, you can train parents, um, you, can turn, you can train employees in a workplace to say, this looks like it might be a problem. And then we set up processes for taking that information to people who are in a position to intervene appropriate, if we can get appropriately. If we can get the right services, the right intervention, we can involuntarily commit individuals to hospitals when they meet certain legal criteria. We can get out ahead of what ultimately happened at Newtown. Neil, this doesn't sound like anything that the federal government could really take on. I mean, you're talking the micro level here. You're talking the the individual classroom, the individual kid. This is not something that can be solved far away in Washington, D.C. This is community, county, maybe state. I don't see the federal government here. No, I, the federal government is just incapable of handling these mass ta these huge meta tasks. And, you know, and I, I'm also curious, Andrew, where, where Carolyn, you know, how she feels the fact that that father was absent in the home. It seems that we've spent you know, a few decades in this country devaluing the role of masculinity and masculine role figures and fathers, uh, it may be as simple as having a strong father in the home that would solve a lot of these problems. I think it's a matter of having a strong family unit, a family structure. You know, we know, I think it's 51 percent of people get divorced, um, but there is a push for fathers to have more involvement, have more rights. I think the courts need to understand that and work and reflect on that. So I agree with you. It's family structure. It's, you know, keeping the families, whether there's a divorce or separation or an intact marriage in the home, keeping parents involved with children. And again, we train parents to look for behaviors and notice what's going on with their children or even their adult children. They see the individual much more than a teacher would see or maybe even an employer in a workplace would see. And, but give them the opportunity to have somewhere to take that. You know, our mental health system is so broken. We don't have the ability um, or there hasn't been allocation or usage of funds to fund men outpatient programs, more therapists, more residential treatment programs, more um, mental health supportive housing, where people can live, get services, hopefully stay in treatment, and can be as stable as, as everyone else. I'm sure Neil would agree with me with one concern that how do we protect the rights of the individual here? You know, I, I, I had a weird sense of humor as a kid and I liked punk rock and things like that. I would hate to think that somebody would raise a red flag that turns out not to be a red flag, but have them have that follow them through the rest of their lives. What, how would we approach this with, with a, a precision? which is to say we want to look for these red flags. Neil and I don't want to see people with mental health issues get their hands on guns, but we also don't want to see overreaction take over. Right, I agree, and we don't want to see that either because that leads to stigma and fear, and then it swings the whole other way where people are labeled, you're mentally ill, you're dangerous, and so on. And I mean, if you are, you should be labeled. If you're not, you shouldn't be. But right? labeling is really not what we're looking to do. We don't want to add to the stigma. It's already a problem. What we want to do is identify the behaviors and then have a system which we've set up in order to triage that. You know, is it just a kid who's creative and writing store horror, potential horror movies? Or is it a kid or an adult 
who really can go further with that. And remember, these things don't happen in isolation. You know, you have to look at the big picture. You have to look at the history. You have to look at what's gone on. You have to look at sort of the evidence, if you will, of what you have. Is it one writing, or is this a series of writing that has gone on since fifth grade? Yeah, if you start writing those more things. more graphic and more scary. That's a different scenario well, you know, we also, than we have a college kid in a writing class who's very creative and likes to write dark things. And I, you know, I, I just, as long as the individual is protected, and I got to leave it there. Neil, Carolyn, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Now, come